in order to be successful, you have to do more than the average. I had, you know, one or two influential people in my life that tried to convince me not to do it. But, you know, faith without works is dead, man. We only have one life. We, you know, we walk by faith, not by sight. So I put all my life savings into that one truck. Don't let anybody spoil your dream. You know, just be intentional about your decision. And, you know, like momentum means doing something after you just to, you know, have that killer instinct to know that, you know, you serve a God who, who, who he got you, man. We're all born to be great. This is Dwayne Wilshire with Lane Construction, and you are now watching Truck and Hustle. All right, Hustle fam, Hustle fam, we are back with another amazing episode and today I am in Maryland. I think I'm in Gambrills. Is my man, am I in Gambrills? Gambrills. Gambrills, yes, Maryland. Usually when I come to Maryland, I come to get some good seafood, some crab or something like that. But today I'm with the man himself, Mr. Dwayne Wilshire from Lane Construction. He is out here doing his thing in the dump truck world. He's grown to nine trucks now, about to be at 10. Correct, sir. He has a really, really interesting story. Um, and I want to share it with you, man, with, with, with you guys. So... Welcome to Truck and Hustle, Dwayne. Thanks for having me. Rami. Thank, thank you for being here. All right, so we're gonna get into the story, man. Everybody loves dump trucks. Um, you got into the game. You're not originally from here, right? So you come from Jamaica, correct? Right. All right. So we're gonna get into your story, man, and just and just talk about it, man. Um, I just kind of put it out there. Spoiler alert! But tell everybody where you're from and a little bit about you know growing up. Well, uh, again, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm from Jamaica, as you can probably hear with the accent. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, grew up from a community, Spalling, from Spalling, Clarendon. Um, went to Knox College. I come from a single family home uh, where my mother worked from abroad to you know, provide for us. Left us in the care of our dear aunt. I had a great aunt. I still have a great aunt who raised us, Auntie Melva. And... Um, Sitting right here, she used to send us to church, so I'm from a strict background. Um, we go to church. She used to ensure that we have grown up with uh, great values. Uh, every Sunday, we would go to church, and um, I could still hear her voice right now ringing in my ears saying, you know, Uno, get up out of the bed, <laughs> go feed the hog before you go to school, tie out the goat them. So we used to have chores where we have to ensure that the animals are taken care of first before we could leave the house. So um, I uh, matriculated to uh, having a coveted job, very coveted position rather, out of Portmore, Jamaica, a call center called eServices. Spent like seven years there as a workforce manager. I used to also do car selling and rent cars on the side and then after that uh, an opportunity presented itself you know for me to migrate here to the united states back in 2000 2011 okay so that's okay a little bit of background about got that. it so bo born and, and raised in jamaica 2011 when you came here how old were you <laughs> i think i was i want to say i was like 30 years old okay I, i'm sorry maybe 30 30 31 years old 32 I mean, Got it. And you said you held a couple different jobs in Jamaica. Um, you said, what was the job you said? you said? I was a workforce manager at a call center called eServices Group International okay. out of Portmore. So, and I used to work, you know, in Montego Bay and um, St. Lucia. I used to travel as a workforce manager to ensure that the operations and the staffing is correct. So, okay. Got it. So, what brought you to the U.S.? And like I said earlier, an opportunity presented itself for me to migrate here. What's the opportunity? The opportunity is uh, I had a family who, you know, filed for me at the time. Okay. So that was the opportunity. So I was stuck between uprooting myself from Jamaica and coming here as an adult. Yeah. Leaving my 30 years roots behind to come and uh, adapt to the American culture. That, that had to be tough, right? I mean, very, very especially tough. at 30, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty much like settled and well, maybe not settled, but you're accustomed is a better word to changes. Know. Yeah, constant yeah. changes. Of course. Um, I, I got the opportunity back in 2011. I 
as soon as I got here, I just never feel comfortable just sitting down. I'm used to working and doing stuff. So I enrolled in my first gym membership at Walmart. Okay. And by that, I mean, I you got- You said your gym membership. Because <laughs> <laughs> that didn't go over my head, but again, I'm listening. Gym membership. Your gym membership. When I started here, when I came to the States immediately, you know, thank God for my mom at the time, she took me to Walmart one night with her friend and- I heard a Jamaican guy talking, you know, packing shelves, and I'm like, He's like, that's me. That's me, right. <laughs> so I went and I said, hey, how do you get a job here? And he said, just go to the front, ask for the manager, and there's a kiosk. They'll take you there, and you apply there. When I applied there, um, they called me in and be, uh, what position are you interested in? I said, I want to do the overnight stocking. So the lady was like, you're not gonna stock any shelves with this resume, <laughs> so right because you came from like a call center. Correct. So, right, so you didn't know nothing about lifting lifting boxes. No, I'm yeah. Six Sigma quantified and all of that good stuff. So okay, um, she probably looked at it and like she told me straight up, you're like, not gonna last. You're not gonna last. I'll come back tomorrow and we'll you know have you interview for an open position for a supervisor that's available. But anyways, I. Turned that down, I told her, hey, I can lift 50 pounds easily. I yeah. can get the job done. This is all I want to do. Why did you want to do something physical as opposed to doing something behind the desk, man? Because I, I uh, would have definitely went for the supervisor position if I was you. Very good question. I mean, to me, coming here in the States, it was in Boone, New Jersey. It's kind of hard leaving. I used to tell people, hey, you're hired, hey, you're fired, or coach people. Now, months later, I'm here in the states you know packing dog food and that's what i mean by i had a i didn't want to expose myself to really being seen by somebody to say hey ain't that the manager dear you know i, I was kind of you're trying to be low key low key to to be honest so i figured if i work at night nobody would see me mm. and i remember the first bag of dog food i lift i cried <laughs> i'm like god what did i do to myself I swear to you, my wife was on the phone at that time and I cried, man. I said, man, I be packing dog foods here. What did I sign up for? And thank God I have a wife that encouraged me, say, hey, just hang on in there. You, you could do this and so on and so right. forth. Right, so the so. cat food is lighter. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that, but that, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. So, um, you, okay, so you, you, what were you doing before you got that job? Because you came over, you said you had an opportunity to come over. Right. Basically get your citizenship and everything here, right? No. No? I actually got filed for. So oh, you got filed my, for it. Correct. Okay, got you. What does that mean? Because I'm, I'm not sure. Filed for meaning I had family member here who filed for me. So I was approved even before coming here. Oh, my, okay. I got my green card and I got my eviction notice from the United States. Thank you very much. <laughs> got it. <laughs> to tell me it. to leave Jamaica within six months. Okay. So I had to leave the country. Oh, man. After my filing came through. Does that is that typical? Is that what normally happens? If Yes. If whoever is filing for you is here and... Uh, you're in another country. The paperwork is done here. As long as it gets approved, then the United States communicate with Jam with the Jamaican consulate. And you, you know, can't be a dual citizen. Yes, at the time I had the option. Yeah, and I chose to pledge my allegiance to to the, the flag. Great, the well, great well flag. welcome. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So you said when you first got here, you were kind of like just laying around a little bit, right? You were like, I don't want to. Uh, you was like, I don't want to lay around. That's the words you used. Just a little bit. Okay. Meaning like a, a couple of weeks. It didn't okay, last for got three it, weeks. Got it. Got it. Got it. Because you don't look like the kind of guy that lays around for too long. No. All I, right. So, uh -huh. so the first job you get is Walmart. Walmart. The first job. All right. So you lifting the dog food. You crying to your wife now. So, okay. What, what happens after that? Um, I ended up getting another job. I started to work at Payless shoe store. Okay. So my brother uh, hooked me up, you know, so I had a day job now, full time. Then I um, moved from that job, not moved, I added another job. So I ended up having three full time jobs. I was working at a company out of New York called uh, Cablevision, okay. Cablevision um, Internet Company. And as God would have it, I ended up moving up in rank to the same position I had in Jamaica. Okay. So I had three jobs at the time. I used to work five days a week. So at Walmart. Jamaicans do have a lot of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's true. It's it's very true. It's not a myth. It's not in you our said blood I to had sit. Three jobs. Go ahead, I had man. three jobs within five months of. And coming they're all here. different. That's crazy. Yes. You work at Payless. You mm -hmm. got the dog food and then yes. cable vision. That's correct. So I used to <laughs> do all three jobs. 
I How did didn't... you find the time to do all that, man? Well, so you working at night at Walmart? I mean, at work Walmart. at nights. Yeah. I used to work Sunday to fr- Sunday through Thursday every night at Walmart. The job starts at eleven, and it you know we get off at five, and then I'll go from there. I'll probably sleep in my car sometimes. I leave from there and go to Cablevision, you know, and then on my days off, I go full time at Payless. So I never, I was never getting any rest. Wow, man, you was hustling. Very much so. All right, keep on going. Because, I mean, I had my wife. You yeah, know, you got to take care of her. And I had bills yeah. and expenses. So 100%. I, you know, I, I have seen how the world is set up. Like, in order to be successful, you have to do more than the average. That's right. So I believe, honestly, that. If you work a nine to five, it's just to get by, unless you're making millions of dollars. But any hour outside of nine, 10, 12, that's how you invest into your future. Yeah. And that's the mentality that I have. I like that. Right? I like that. All right. So working three jobs. Yes, sir. What happens next? Keep, keep um, going with Working story. three jobs. I ended up quitting Walmart okay. and <laughs> quitting Payless because there was an opportunity to work overtime. Okay. So at the time, the money was I was making at Walmart, an opportunity presented itself to work uh, overtime at the com- cable company that I was working for. And I'm like, if I work an hour and a half, that's time and a half. So that money is twice the amount of working one hour. At Walmart. At Walmart. So right. I quit Walmart. Okay. Then the same thing played out to um, Payless. I ended up quitting Payless and I devoted all my time to just working cable vision and... Um, I started doing, I think Hurricane Sandy came about. Okay. Um, back in, I'm not sure. What's that, like 12, Tw- 13, 14? N- no, it's 2000 and, 2012, 13. 12? Correct. Okay. Around that time. All right. And uh, an opportunity present itself, presented itself where James Dolan at the time, owner for New York Knicks, he's the owner for the company at the time. Yeah. They had this thing called premium pay. So you will get like three times the amount of your hourly salary if you come in because it was declared a uh, disaster back in Jersey. Right. So at the time I was killing it. I started to work from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day. And then they also asked for individuals to watch the generators because in the, you know, the high society communities, you know you can't have them not without cable. (laughs) So I used to go there at 12 in the night to sit, watch the generator. If the red light comes on, I would call a number and say, hey, the red light came on, which means it needs fuel, and they will send somebody up there. So I used to drive all the way back in Bonton, Morristown, New Jersey, to watch the generator. Sometimes I can hardly make it back to start my shift at 6, but it was premium money. They were paying like, I think I made like $400 a night. $400 a night just a to night. sit based just, on the money that was being paid. generator. So I did that for two to three months, man. And okay. two to three months, I had so much money. I... I, I almost felt rich. <laughs> <laughs> how, much did you have? how much money do you have? How much did you stack up? I remember my first paycheck um, was over $8,000 in two weeks after taxes. <laughs> okay. okay. And that went on for three months. Wow. Okay. And um, I had so much money saved up that time that I went back to Jamaica, I bought a piece of land, mm. and I went back into the car rental business. I left some cars with a friend of mine. Okay. I used to drive a 1998 Mitsubishi Mirage. It had no AC or anything in it. Um, I was very proud of that car. <laughs> <laughs> and I upgraded that car. I got me something nice. And I dumped a lot of money in my 401k okay. at that time. Okay. had my 401k at about 25% at the time. Got it. Match. Yes. 25 percent so so you're, you're just stacking money i was just stacking saving you know, uh got uh, a nice 401k got some cash in your pocket yes everything's good with my head screwed on all right That's talk right. to me what happens next uh what happened next is i was enjoying myself at this company and um years passed by back in my brother omar wiltshire wiltshire trucking yeah he called me one day around 2000 and 2013 to 14 they were about and he'd be like hey bro um you need to go get your cdl and i'm like i've been doing call center work all my life what do you mean get my cdl <laughs> i don't know nothing about trucking so he's like you never know what the future holds you know so go get your cdl and um because he was doing trucking at that time so i went to uh it was a school back in new jersey i think their name is uh 
uh, a trucking company down in S- South Smith. Smith Solomon? There you go. Smith and thank you, sir. Yeah. Smith I went, and I went Solomon. there too. That's how I know about them. Right. So I would go there at 4.30 a.m. in the morning before I go to work. Okay. So I ended up getting my commercial license at Class A eventually. It sit in my pocket for years. Um, after that, I uh, I got a I was at church because I you know recently gave my life to the to the Lord, right. and I started to you know be in church a lot. So I was invited to a church service back over in Patterson, New Jersey. A friend of mine invited me to a Friday service, and um, went there. Pastor was preaching, you know, started prophesying and. Alta call, she started to describe an individual, and I'm like, ain't she talking about me? Because <laughs> she described this individual, and I know it was me. She said some stuff that the person was going through, because at the time, the company was being sold to a company called Altis, and there's no way she knew about that, because that person She's was from Jamaica. company name? It's, it's Altis now. She said Altis, like out of mouth? No, I, the, the, her words, oh, okay. her words was... Hitting got describing you. this individual, got it, got you, it, got it, got it, your got it. call center, and so on and so forth. Got it, got, got like, it, got it. And it was you. So she's like, Come on up here. I start to look behind me, like, She ain't talking about me. Mm. But eventually, I was led to the altar, and she looked at me. My wife went up there with me, and she looked at me, and she said, Hey, the Lord showed me you, your profile. I see you driving a very big, big truck. And the Lord said, He's gonna have you open your business if you stay true to your word. Hmm. Of your commitment. <clears throat> okay. Man, on my way home, I wanted, I asked my wife, I said, you know, no disrespect, man. I'm not critiquing the woman of God, but I think she was on something. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's no way, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. She described me, right. told me about me, but I just couldn't get the part that driving trucks. Correct. A couple weeks later, a good friend of mine, never forget this day, about 5.30 one morning, um, good friend of mine, Natoya Cole, called me and she's like, hey, I know it's early and I apologize for calling you, but I got a word for you. I said, what is that? She said, you know, I was praying and the Lord brought you up in front of me. And the Lord said, you need to go down to Maryland and go prophesy over any area and he's going to establish you there. Mm. And it's weird because she, I didn't tell her about the encounter that I had weeks before at right. the church. So I said, right. Time, you know, a couple months passed by, my brother, you know, I came to see my brother because I have a very, very, very good relationship with my brother. And, um, you know, I came to visit him. And coming down off of 95, I remember it's like a, it's like a phone call from heaven. Just got it in my, flash in my brain saying, hey, you were told to prophesy. You're in Maryland. now." I'm like, what? Yeah, I'm in Maryland. <laughs> so I was in Bowie at the time and I stopped, pulled over the car. And I said, Lord, you told Abraham, as far as his eyes can see from the east to the west, it's his. And I prophesy under the, with the same faith like Abraham. Mm. I don't know. You said I'm in Maryland now, so I'm prophesying. I want to establish myself here. I was in Bowie at the time. So the Lord's word never returned unto him void. And as time would have it, I ended up moving here. The same description of the job, it happened. I ended up coming down here as a dispatcher for my brother because mm. I never, I ended up leaving the job that I couldn't stay at that place anymore. Right. We don't I believe that when you're being when you get a word from God, don't fight it. Mm. Cuz I was so uncomfortable and I can't produce in an uncomfortable environment. So I came down here and uh started doing dispatching. I was traveling twice a week coming down from New Jersey. Here I was doing like 1600 miles a week because my wife at the time had a we had our second son. So I had to go back and forth, back and forth. And you probably know what this, what the distance is. From yeah, yeah, yeah. So I used to do that twice a week, coming down here to do dispatching, helping out, you know, learning the business. The business. Life. Not to own my own truck, but just <clears throat> to say, you know what? If I'm going to live my life to the fullest and I got God's word, this is where I'm going to be. So I ended up coming down here. Truck and Hustle family, I'm coming to you with an exclusive deal just for you. Call 800 800- 991-6251 to get 10% off on your first purchase. What's the business look like when you when you join? I'm sorry? What's what does the business, your brother's business look like when you join? Like how big is it? Uh my brother was doing very well for himself. Um 
he 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 was running um he's a broker as well so he was doing like 50 i would say 50 to 50 to 70 trucks a day okay so he has uh 25 dump trucks for himself okay so i was dispatching over 50 trucks a day got it so he was doing very well for himself i was super busy doing yeah. dispatching for him now what did that dispatching job look like for you you said you do it two times a week you'd come up no no i used to travel back and forth so i could be here for the entire week oh, but i'll just run back on a wednesday so check on, on the wife check on the kids and then come back and the then come the back drive back down the same day got it got it so, okay so continue so um dispatching taught me a lot i mean based on what i used to do and my experience it wasn't that hard for me call because center, right? call center, I was managing over 6,000 employees and stuff like that. So right. managing 50 trucks, telling them where to go and all of that good stuff, it's like second nature. So it wasn't that hard. The challenging part was, you know, drivers would have been calling like 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I don't understand my schedule. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? Right. At least let me sleep. Go, You know what I'm saying? So right. it was kind of challenging. And my brother is a, is a strict person. You have to answer the dispatch phone, so you don't want to miss a call because you're gonna hear his voice. That's right. So, um, it your was, brother older than you or younger? He's younger. Younger, okay. just older. Where <laughs> this is cuts. younger, older. Younger, older. I call it. him. I call him kid. My little kid brother. So okay. That's where dispatch landed me. Um, I I didn't like it that much because you know I started not to feel comfortable. I wanted more, and one day, uh, you know. I had a dream, and in the dream, sounds like a story, right? <laughs> it's a good in story. In the dream, um, I just had a vision, and he's like, hey, tell your brother that, you know, you need to go drive your own truck, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, you need to, because I could drive a dumb truck because I went to school for it, right. but I just got the license, and it was dormant for many years, yeah. so I didn't really know how to, I had to probably get somebody to teach to me To teach again. you again, right. So long story short, one day he just told me in his office, he, you know, I'm like, man, I want to tell him, but I can't. He's my brother. Maybe he's going to fire me or something. <laughs> yeah. But he just looked at me and he's like, hey, I don't think this is working out for you, man. Um, your last day in dispatch. It's like, okay. So he said, um, moving tomorrow, I'm going to send you with one of my drivers, Jermaine, at the time. So he put me with one of his drivers and said the driver should have, you know, teach me how to you know get back in the groove i only lasted like three days or a week with that guy he was all about his money he yeah. will give me the truck maybe if he stopped that he's pulling over to the royal farms or somewhere he will slow down stop the truck like a mile away and say drive it down because <laughs> <laughs> he never want me to mess up his uh flow right so that's how i i i got a little bit of practice until about a week later my brother just called me and said hey you're going to work today so he put me in a truck. I can only shift four gears because you know the truck has one, two, three, four. You put it in high, high range. Yeah. I didn't know how to pass four. Mm. So I didn't even know how to dump my first load. Oh, man. So he said, call him when I reach the dump site. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up going to the dump site while I'm driving there, our favorite our best friend, Mr. D.O.T., pulls me over. <laughs> mm. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what did I do wrong now? So the officer came up to the truck. He's like, um, where are you heading? I said, I'm heading like uh, maybe another 15, 20 minutes, sir. He's like, um, you know why I pulled you over? I said, I, I don't know. He said, listen, man, you're driving too slow. You see all that traffic? I look behind <laughs> Impeding you, traffic. Like, Long line of traffic. Yeah. It's like, you sure the truck is okay? I said, officer, to be honest, it's my first time out and I can't pass the fort. <laughs> <laughs> I was just being honest. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's like, okay, hurry up, get off the road and don't come back till you can at least shift to five. <laughs> oh my God. So that was my first time out. And I started to, you know, get practice. My brother will take me every now and again, practice. And eventually I end up buying my first truck. Okay. This was like maybe... Two months after driving around, he put me on some local job where you just like an hourly job, pipe work job. You just sit there. So it wasn't a job that requires me to do much. Yeah. So tell me about that process. You, you end up buying your first truck. So what made you go out, stop working and say, you know, I'm going to buy my truck? What was the, the, the circumstances that happened to make you feel comfortable doing that? Um, Of course, you know, I got the word to buy my truck, but my brother allowed me to practice. 
he played a vital role in you know sourcing um, a friend of ours CNR trucking. Well, we bought a truck. When I bought my first truck, I had the money saved up. That's the good thing. When I started out, I had the money saved to up. buy the truck out, right? Yes, I bought my first truck. How much you pay for it? <laughs> I paid uh, 50, 50. Well, I one of my trials and tribulation really was the price of the truck. Okay. Um, the the guy changed the price on me like three times. <laughs> okay. So he agreed that next week Monday he will hand the truck over because the truck wasn't working at the time. It had a blown engine and stuff. But the price got changed on me three times. Where did it, it was, start? It started at thirty five. <laughs> And it just kept on and then graduating. A day later, he called me. He's like, "Hey, you know, I really like this truck, and I think if I'm gonna give it up, it's gonna be, you know, forty thousand." I said, "Okay." Yeah. Two days later, he called back again. Say, "Hey, man, I think, I think it's forty-five thousand. Wow. And I'm, I'm not kidding you. The Monday, the Sunday, actually, I got a call. This guy said fifty grand. <laughs> so if you want it. Tomorrow, right. come up with come it. I'm like, it. man, I only have that much in my account. So my wife told me at the time, like, hey, just go for it. You know, like they say with the saints, press along, saints, press along. I just decided to press along with the pur purchase. Yeah. And my brother told me that based on the type of truck and the engine the truck had at the time, don't worry about the engine not working because once the engine is repaired, then you're going to have a good truck. Mm. So I ended up. Purchasing um, that truck for fifty grand, 50, I was flat hours. broke. Borrowed some money, emptied out the bank account, emptied out my four hundred one k. Four hundred one k. Yes, I took all my retirement savings. I took a big, uh, I think it's a leap of faith. Yeah, I had you know one or two influential people in my life that tried to convince me not to do it. But you know, faith without works is dead, man. We only have one life. We you know we walk by faith, not by sight. So that's I, right. I. I put all my life savings into that one truck. Mm. And um, you see where I'm at today. <laughs> Got you. All right. So you, you you get the truck and you said you, you start working. So are, is your brother helping you out with some jobs? How are you getting to work? Of course. Um, definitely. Um, I I started working. But can I say something before I started Absolutely. working? That truck after the engine got repaired had a major, major light issue. I had to operate with the sun coming up and going down. Only the headlights would work. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I either had to leave the yard at 7.30 when the light come, came out, when the sun, <laughs> and, and go back from before the sun. Before the down. sun, you're running with the sun. So the sun was my, fav my best friend at the time. That's right. Until that issue got um, fixed. Okay. Right. So my brother at the time, he, as I said, he, he's a broker and... Um, I mean, you broke in 50 to 70 trucks. I'm not worried about work. Right, right, <laughs> I'm right. your brother. Right. Plus, I'm your bigger brother. <laughs> right, right, right. So I wasn't concerned much about work, to be honest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what, what what kind of work were you doing when you first got started? When I first got started, I was hauling dirt, you know, mostly dirt jobs, contaminated, you know, running from my first job was from the the Air Force base up in uh, off of... Uh, White Marsh Road in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. We used to haul dirt all the way over to a place called Hagerstown, like two and a half hours. <laughs> okay. And that was my first job, man. And I wasn't familiar with the truck. And man, I, I'm glad maybe I, I, I almost thought I needed to wear a diaper on my first. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long did it take you to get into the flow? Because you, you said you could barely shift the gear. So how, how long did it take you to get comfortable behind the wheel? I would say... Maybe two weeks, to be honest, a couple of weeks, because I'm a fast learner. And okay. The, I had no choice. Right. When your back is against the wall, you had you have no more no option but to just take the the, the bull by the horn. Yeah. And I got the flow of it pretty fast. Okay. You know? All right. So now you're in business for yourself. Things are changing. Your brother is helping you out with the with the loads. Correct. But now you're a business person. So how does that change things for you? What do you What do you have to think about now? you know for your business not you're not an employee anymore right i well very good question um not an employee anymore i don't just have responsibility as a husband or a father i know i have a responsibility as a, a business owner right so i ended up buying a, my second truck brand new kw eight months after i started driving my own truck okay and um 
if you listen to what people say about you, you'll if you follow that, you'll never go anywhere. I believe if you know having a dream, you know, and 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 being intentional, it you know, with faith you can move mountains. So with that being said, I bought my second truck because I always looked at it like my brother is a broker. I should be able to get another truck. I'm not worried about work. So I bought my second truck, a brand new KW. And by the way, I have a point and sign credit. So zero down at the time. Okay. And I rolled off a brand new truck, had my second truck. So that's how I started acquiring. And um, How much did that truck cost you though? What was the, what was the cost of the truck? Uh, that truck through the door was like two, uh, 276000 276? 276. The truck was about... Um, a hundred and uh, seventy eight thousand at the time. Then you know, you know, registration and stuff. Another twenty five, and then, and then financing. And I yes. That's with the dump. Everything. No, two hundred and seventy six thousand. It okay. cost me. Is everything completely? Everything completed to the door. Okay, mm -hmm. got you. And what was your note on that? Would you have to pay monthly? Yes, I had to pay monthly. Um, three thousand. I paid so often. <laughs> <laughs> I had three thousand three hundred and eighteen dollars and eighty three cents. Okay, I paid every month. All right, got it. Mm -hmm. But now we gotta we gotta make the money for that note, right? So now Correct. you got to hire a driver. You know, before I bought, I bought that truck without a driver. <laughs> okay. I don't know, man. I'm just a man of faith. Do you think you're going to drive both trucks? I don't. I No, I didn't think I was going to drive both <laughs> trucks because, remember, one of my trucks was already paid for. Correct. That's already a cushion. It's already on the side. So I'm saying, so Makes I sense. started to drive the new truck myself. Uh, then I put the word out for a driver. Okay. So I'm saying, so okay. that, that's how I... So you start driving a new truck and um, then you put the word out for the drivers. How do you find your first driver? My first driver I found, uh, it's word of mouth. A good friend of mine, Santana Trucking. Okay. You know, he referred. I think I've seen them before. Santana Trucking. He yeah. does tractor trailers. Yeah. Yeah, so he was a, he's still a good friend of mine. And he referred this young lady to me by the name of Angie. and um, Young she, lady? Yes. She, Women are the best drivers. Yes. I always I say I totally it. agree with that. They're, best they're, they're safe. They're detail-oriented. They're organized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They care about the job. There you go. And they have a, a point to prove. That's great. They have a chip on their shoulder a lot of times mm -hmm. because they're the quote unquote male dominated industry. So they Correct. They, they gotta come out here and do their thing. So Correct. women make great drivers. And she's still with me. Okay. Until today. So she was your first driver. First driver she's and she's with still with me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got you. All right. So now you start building the business. So tell me about like how you start scaling and how you start building your, your company. I I said I only wanted two trucks and that's it. <laughs> And of course, Lane Construction, the name Lane is from my son's name, Liam. My first son is Liam Alfonso, and uh, my second son is Isaiah Norway in Wilshire. So I just took their, take their first, two first initials, L-A, and my second son, A, um, I-N, and put it as Lane. Okay. So that gives me the drive every time i see the trucks and the business i know i'm doing this for my kids you know That's generational right. wealth and i'm just doing it for them really so um i ended up buying a, a another truck it's like every year i started to add on and before i do anything i always pray about it because this is a i'm a god-fearing person and i i believe in prayer so I incorporate prior in everything I do before I, you know, I have to feel that move to do stuff, you yeah. know, and get the clearance. So I bought a third truck. And when I bought the third truck, I didn't have a driver for it either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Another I, brand new truck. No, this was not brand this new. This is not brand new. Okay. I took all my savings again. I had to rely on my wife again for some. Because it's the tough, dumb, dumb truck is, is tough, especially where repairs is concerned. Yeah. So you'll be making a lot of money, but you will have one problem that will take all of that money and some. Gotcha. So I had to rely on my, you know, little savings. I borrowed some money from my dear brother at the time and um, put together some money from my wife, myself, my brother, and I purchased a third truck because it was a good deal. So I couldn't allow that deal to pass. Got it. You know. Got it. So now you have three trucks. No, I have three trucks. Yeah, in the red. You owe some people some money. Yes, sir. And it's continuing to grow. Talk, talk to me about the business, like the operations. What type of money are you making? Are you still running the same routes that um, are you only relying on your brother for work or uh, are you start expanding, working with other brokers? Talk, talk to me about that. Uh, no, I'm not reliant on my brother anymore. 
you know, he, you know, like the Eagles kicking out their chicks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my brother and I bump heads sometimes, and um, he's, of course, my mentor. He still is, give great advice and insights. That being said, I he started to give me, he was the, I, my first contract that I have for myself was given to me by him. Okay. He said to me like, hey, you know, I'm giving you this customer. It's not going to be through me. You build this customer directly, you keep all of it. Because he's a broker. You know, once the money goes to a broker, they have to do what they have to do. Yeah. So at the time, he gave me, you know, a company, uh, a little ask for a company. And they're still my number one customer until today. Okay. And um, he said, take it over. And um, this is what I'm doing for my nie- for my nephews, you know, my niece and my nephews. Yeah. So... That's all yours. So that's how I started. And then I watched how he operated. And with the knowledge that I have, it. I believe if you study successful people and do what they do, you'll do better than them. If you study unsuccessful people and don't do what they do, you will never be like them. Right. Or you'll so, be just as better at being unsuccessful. There you go. <laughs> so that's what I, I started to build my own Till, until I uh, started to print my own tickets, I, my first batch of tickets was 500 tickets. I really didn't have much job. <laughs> so mm. I'm like, when is it that I'm going to use these tickets and stuff? So um, with that, I started to, uh, I bought another truck because I had a friend of mine came from Jamaica, said he was with his mom in, 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 in Florida. So I said, hey, man, come see me. I know he's a smart guy. He came to me like three, four years ago. And I'm going to tell his name is Gregory Peart. And um, he just came to visit me and he never left. I trained him. I, you know, taught him how to drive the dumb truck, mm. took him in the brand new truck, got his license. And he drove that truck that I bought and he was dedicated, you know, still is dedicated. And um, we moved from there to uh, acquire, we had the, 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 um, the COVID came in, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I had three trucks. So at the time, that this was like three years ago. And um, a friend of mine said, hey, you know, grandson is selling out some trucks, you know, getting new trucks. I'm like, man, he sent me a picture and he said, this one is going for 35000 I purchased the truck because it was a good truck. And I still have that truck in my fleet today. So I bought that truck from um, grandson. Never have a driver. Every time I buy a truck, I never had, never have a driver. And, you know, the driver came along and then COVID came along. Mm. Then everybody was running, you know, uh, crazy. Everybody worried about the corona. I be- it was a blessing for me. I have never been so busy in my entire trucking career mm. as, it, as I was in COVID. <laughs> what were you busy doing? The same thing or different jobs? I got... My brother again gave me this uh, this guy who wanted truck, but the guy was so specific. He told my brother like, "Hey, I need if you have a dedicated driver, you know, a driver who is on time." He gave a, my brother a description of me. <laughs> so <laughs> I happened to come to his office, and he was like, "Oh, here's the guy you're looking for." And he introduced me to the guy, and um, I started to do some night asphalt work with him until I had when the COVID came. When I, the work was slow, to be honest, but this is how he got picked up. I got a call from him one morning. He said, hey, um, do you have a truck available? At that time, I had no, you know, it was very slow. I had, I had my truck sitting in the yard, <laughs> you know, but I have drivers who live in close by, very dedicated. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't tell him. I'm like, yeah, I have a truck available. He said, could you send the truck up here? In um, Owens Mills, I sent the truck there, and he agreed to pay me the start time of seven because technically I'm helping him. Right. So they agreed to pay me the start time, not when the truck gets there, but from seven o'clock. Okay. So then he calls me back another hour. Do you have another truck or two? I'm like, what's up with this guy? And uh, I say, yeah, no problem. I'm. A, I tell him I'm. I'm gonna pull the truck and you know, let you have it. Then he called me back a fourth, a third time for another truck. Called my driver. And driver wasn't available. I jumped in the truck myself. Mm. <laughs> Drove up to Owens Mills, and I realized it was a big pipe job at the time. They were doing like seven miles worth of pipe work. And 
the evening after I went home, he said, you know what, man? I had this guy contracted with me and um, he's a no-show. Still isn't answering his phone. And I like how your team came out there and performed. I want to make an offer to you. This job is going to go for over a year. If you can commit to me two trucks every day, that's all I need from you. Mm. Two trucks every day. You can stay in this job until completion. And that was when I landed one of my biggest contracts, all because I showed up, my drivers did what they were supposed to do, and um, it went from there. So all all through COVID, that's what I've been doing, pipe work, mm. which is one of the easiest jobs to do. Pipe religion. work? Yeah. You just have your truck sit there, and basically the contractors will dig, you know, dig strategically around the pipes, load the trucks up, but most of the time you're sitting. So those are easy jobs where... You know, I strive for the, you know, I like those kind of jobs. So they're digging around the pipe or they're digging dirt around the they're pipe? They're digging, yeah. And you're, then you're taking that dirt out? Taking it to the yard, correct. Okay. So the truck doesn't move until the truck gets loaded. Right. Because sometimes they may hit a, a gas line and it may take an hour or a couple of hours before the fire truck gets there, give clearance to start digging again. Right. So those but are they still jobs. pay you from the time the truck is there, which will start at like seven o'clock. Yes, sir. Typically, how long will you be there? Like, hours. will the truck sit there? Um, sometimes nine and a half, ten hours. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the truck is just pretty much sitting there all day. Sitting. How many loads of, of that would you do if everything's working correctly? How, how how many loads would you do? I would say each truck do two, three loads down the street. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's close. Very close, like a mile. They normally have when they do government contracts like that. They normally have a yard where you know they store the material because no dump is open at certain hours of the night because yeah. they converted the job to a night job. So we would have uh, taken the material to their yard in the night and then in the morning, you know, of course they hire the trucks to take it to the open um, dump sites. How many other uh, companies are out there with you? In term, just, like with on that job? Just the guy's trucks and my trucks. So just you? You just, have that exclusively? He gave it exclusively to me and um, if I needed an extra spot, um, I always could ask and he'll say yes. Okay, so that's pretty special. That's a huge opportunity. That's a big blessing, yeah, of course. And then um, after that, SBA played a vital role in my growth. Um, of course, you know, the government, SBA, Small Business Administration, um, I got aid in from them. So, you know, it helped stabilize my cash flow, thank yeah. God. And um, I also bought some newer trucks. Okay. That's where I started to grow you know, larger than I was. Got it. So the business model now, just talk to me a little bit, a little bit about how you run the business. What what are the, 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 the key performance indicators that you have to look at to make sure that you're profitable? Um, you know, just talk to me a little bit about the, the dump truck business. Uh, my KPIs would be the job, the, I'm not so much big on the, price of the job to be honest why not i believe in fairness so the price i don't go for the top dollar if you only go for the like my brother told me like hey don't always go for the moving the big mountains because when the mountain is is moved what else you know say for example a guy all he has in 100 acres is banana trees right 100 acres of banana trees. That's all he can, you can harvest is bananas. But you have a guy with 10 acres. And on that 10 acres, you have some apple trees, some banana trees, bell peppers. He have a variety of different stuff. Mm -hmm. He said, that's the guy you want to work with. Because when the banana season is over, what next? Right. So the analogy is to get yourself situated with a customer who have worked all year round so the kpi for me again is not so much the money the money is a key factor but consistency mm. that's that's what i go for consistency and doing a, a background thorough background check on the potential contractor slash customer how do you do that i google them <laughs> what do you look for i look for their google. longevity i look for what previous i look for you know similar to google i look at their reviews and um you know, I try to stick with a company that is 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 known. 
Mm. You know, and most of the times I run that by my brother. I try to keep my circle very small. I don't try to spread my wings too thin. You just need like maybe three good customers and um, you you should be all set. So what's something that would be like a red flag to you if you read it on Google about a customer that would make you not work with them? Uh, payment issues. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll usually be right there in the comments, right? They, Correct. This customer don't pay. Correct. Time. Payment issues is, is one of my greatest you know turn off yeah you have to pay i believe if i work and then some of these jobs you don't get paid until sometimes 30 to 60 days so i'm I'm paying guys already to do the job and i have to wait 30 to 60 days to get my money yeah i, I don't want to wait until 30 to 60 days for you not to pick up the phone not to answer me or tell me hey I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in bankruptcy. Right. So I stay abreast of the 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 runnings and operations of customers that I I, I you service. I service because if they're going into bankruptcy, it's gonna be on the, every. You can find everything on the internet. How often does that <clears throat> happen in in your industry? Very often, you see we're um, you know very often because this industry is up and down. So you will find where contractors either uh, are not paying the sub the trucks or the jobs get shut down. Also, you said earlier, um, fairness is important to you when it comes to price. So what, what is a fair price and how do you how do you decide what's, what's fair? Because at the end of the day, are you bidding on these projects or is somebody just saying, okay, this is what we're paying? Um, currently, I honestly don't bid on any project um, because I have customers who have their own, you know, like landscaping cost companies, as for companies, you, do, you don't need to bid on that. Mm -hmm. Your uh, work speaks for itself, you know. You, 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 there is no. They don't put it out. If a customer is happy with you, they're not gonna look anywhere else. Got it. If they're happy with your drivers and your performance, ninety percent of the time, you don't have to worry about someone else underbidding you. Got it. But I'm saying more so <clears throat> when you first, um, when, when you when you first acquire the customer, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> Are they basically saying, "Hey, this is what we pay." <clears throat> to, move, oh, to to do the job, uh, accept it or reject it? Or are you saying, hey, this is what I charge to do the job? Uh, <clears throat> the customer, I have a customer right now who told me what they pay. Say, oh, we pay $80 an hour. You know, that's what we pay. And I said to the customer, like, okay, I understand what you pay, but this is what I have to offer. I can give you a full fleet. You are you are now I have exclusive access to all my trucks. I can guarantee you three trucks every day, and the trucks that I'm guaranteeing you are experienced drivers. All my trucks have a sh grain chute on it. All my truck drivers, uh, all my drivers, they can do asphalt milling. All my drivers have a, a clearance. Um, they call it a Twig card clearance. They have a government clearance. And some of these, sometimes you have contractors who get a contract on a government uh, facility and they need that driver with a clear driving record. So when I'm selling the company, these are things that I put out there like, hey, I understand you charge 80, but this is why I need 85. Mm. Because the time may come where the persons you're working for, giving the work for 80, they don't have what I have. My drivers can work night, day, or weekend. I, I my drivers are ready to go. Right. So this is what a, you know entices a customer to know that dependability. If I if I have nine trucks, right, and you're a customer, I if you if 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 John Brown is charging seventy dollars an hour, he only has two trucks. Now you have lane construction. I have nine trucks and some because I. I have my brother by my side if I need extra jobs. Extra capacity, yeah. They're gonna if they're smart, they'll give me the job for a higher price because you're gonna have one of or two of thirty trucks showing up at your job every day versus a guy who only has two trucks. Right. The other morning, last week, I have two trucks that couldn't start because the weather, the the, the temperature dropped. Two trucks that couldn't go out. Thank God I have a spear truck yeah. and I could call my brother and say, "Help me out." So that's what guarantees you work. This is what contractors want to see, dependability, because one truck being a no-show can hold up a whole job. You know, you right. could lose thousands of the contractor not having a reliable truck. So that's my selling point, and it always worked. Yeah. You know?
So you have to sell the value. Sell your value and don't undervalue yourself. So you're able to get extra five dollars potentially. On of the course, job. of course. What 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 price point do you want to be at? In terms of well, it varies. Uh, it depends. You know, you have hourly jobs. If you have a job that hauls concrete, mm -hmm. I normally charge more for that. Okay. Because why? the concrete damages the truck. It's it's wear and tear. It's hitting the bodies. Even though it's a steel body truck, it will pierce the metal sometimes based on how the load was load. So the jobs are priced based on the material that we're hauling. Mm. So it's no set price for hourly jobs. It just fluctuates based on what the job entails. Okay. Know? Okay. So typically, can you give us a, a ballpark figure of what you charge for that hourly? Like, let's say like the, the one you just now spoke of the, uh, what did you say? It was con was concrete, concrete. Well, that's that a, well, typically, that's, that's a higher, that's like that's a higher a, premium, right? If if I'm hauling concrete, I'm a I'm a charge anywhere from ninety to ninety five dollars an hour. Okay. Even though that's cheap, to be and honest, that's still but cheap. It's competitive. It's a competitive rate. It's higher than what you know other guys are making. But fair price is around ninety to ninety five dollars an hour because any given day a concrete can bust your tailgate, cost you a couple hundred dollars to repair it. Mm. So you know, asphalt jobs are a bit a little bit cheaper. You know, anywhere from maybe. Uh, I would say from a 75 to probably 85 bucks an hour because asphalt, you know, it's not hard on the trucks. The trucks does park up and wait on the pavements and so forth. It's easy, e as you would say, easy money. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not worried about asphalt jobs, and it doesn't take a lot of fuel. As you can see, the price for fuel is 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 skyrocket now. Yeah. So, you know, you go for jobs that are require you not to run up and down the highways that you know i go for jobs that as you, you do know, stay yeah. local and close. stay local and close how how transparent are you with your drivers do your drivers know how much you get paid for the jobs and how does that work um people talk and of course my drivers know you know if they want to ask because sometimes you have owner operators out there running their own trucks and they talk to drivers <laughs> and they say rates so I, I'm very, very transparent with my with my drivers. I've never had, I don't have issues where a driver would say, hey, he's making this and I'm making this. No, I pay my drivers well. I take care of them. Mm. So they they don't even want to go out there and entertain any conversation. <laughs> I, yeah, I treat them right. I pay them right. Yeah. So I, 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 I'm very, very transparent with them. And so much to say, I don't even discuss rates with my drivers. Like they don't, as long as they, they know what, they're, they're worried more about their timesheet, right. not what I make. And that's some of the challenges other owners have where you might have a driver coming in and looking at what you're making and then start to think that. I had a driver one time, to be, to be honest, that said that he's no longer with me, by the way, that I'm getting, he's making me rich. And he, that word came out of his mouth. I'm like, if you know the, the recipe for making me rich, uh, why are you not, you know, putting that own recipe on yourself? <laughs> right. So you have drivers who who come in and uh, will watch what you make, and you, even though you agree at the price, but you know, I don't have issues. I I try to be. I am very transparent with my rates. Yeah. And some of the rates have what they call fuel surcharge. So I already I have regular meetings with my drivers. You know where safety meetings safety meetings and i will include uh rates like hey this job if you go out there and you hear it's 110 dollars a load i'm paying you from the from 95 or i'm paying you from 100 this is why tied into this rate the customer have fuel surcharge so some of these rates so some of these uh the guys will tell drivers like 110 dollars but they don't say hey fuel surcharge so i try to educate my drivers as much as possible because I'm not looking to have a driver with me all the days of my life. I believe one of the drivers leaving to do their own thing makes me feel good as an owner. Mm. Because when you leave and buy your own truck, you're going to learn from me. Right. You're not going to learn from me and leave here like a bum. You, when you leave here, you should, I should feel good to say, hey, I run into this guy. He said he, you know, that's word of mouth. I want to educate you here, you learn as much as possible here, that when you leave, you're not working for somebody else. You're going to do your own thing. And that's the culture that I have here. And that's what you did. Pretty right? much. Correct. Right. Got you. Now, are there other ways to get to get paid? I know um, hourly is one way. Do you, you also do weight, right, as well? Tonnage. Tonnage. 
Correct. So do you, you do those kind of jobs also? We do everything. Okay. Um, what do you prefer and why? <laughs> I prefer, honestly, hourly jobs. If I'm doing tonnage, it has to. It have to. Th that's the job that I have to get paid very, very well. I, have to, I, I require premium money. The reason why I say that is, we haul. Okay, all of our trucks, and that's another selling point too. All of our trucks have a portion tags. A portion tags. I'm not sure if you're aware. I am. I but can for go, the audience. Go into that. For the audience, um, means that all my trucks can go into any any state, and I have a annual DC permit, so. I'm not restricted by any area. So even last week, we went down all the way, four and a half hour drive to Shenandoah, Virginia. And that was a very, very good job. <laughs> we only haul one load and make twice the amount that a regular truck would make working locally. So it have to, I believe that the rabbit have to, you know, have meat on it for my dog to leave the porch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I so, like that. but if I have a choice, Hourly jobs, less less strenuous on the trucks, and it preserves the life of the truck. How do you price the tonnage jobs? I I go above and beyond. I go by miles. If I'm gonna price a job, I do that myself. I have a dispatcher who does a very very good job, you know. But when it comes down to pricing, I'm very good at that. Um, I look at the mileage. Yeah, can you, can you explain what goes into it? So somebody okay. who like what's the formula? Well, this is my formula. Your formula. Uh, my formula, I look at the mileage. I look, is the truck going to go through the tolls? Like, I go to Pennsylvania on the borderline of New Jersey for cobblestone sometimes. And how I price that job is you got to go to tolls, up 95, Delaware. You got to go through PA. So I already factor in all of that. Because what you don't want to do is to say I'm charging, example, say, just say $500 for this load. And then after the truck does the route, you look back and like, this was told, that was this. I sit and I spend time and look at the toll, look at the terrain. I take everything into consideration because sometimes, you know, the truck loaded going up a hill burns more fuel. So I take everything into consideration. It has to worth my while and the drivers as well. So I look at the time that the driver have to reach the yard. I take everything into consideration. For a, a job in New Jersey, uh, going all the way up there, that's like a, a, a $1,500 load. Because if I'm going to drive four and a half hours, that means I have to leave my, or the drivers have to leave at a certain time, 2.30, 3 o'clock, the latest. That's a sacrifice. You're coming out of your bed, leaving your uh, family. You know, you should be properly compensated because you should have a price differential. But I price the job based on um, the, the distance. I look at the terrain and, 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 and the toll and the type of material as well. Mm. So if I'm going to charge, example, say $500 from point A to point B hauling some washed concrete sand, I'm not going to charge the same $500 to haul some boulders mm. <laughs> because the boulders is going to be banging your truck. Somewhere along the line, it's going to be rough coming out and something might get damaged. So I charge for a distance and based on the type of the material. All right, guys, listen, before we continue the show, I gotta give a shout out to our sponsor and our partner, OTR Solutions, formerly OTR Capital. But listen, guys, OTR is much, much more than just a factoring company. They provide so many solutions to help the small carrier not only get into business, but to stay in business and maintain, right? So you guys have to partner with them and check them out. Don't take my advice for it. Talk to their clients. Right? Talk to their clients. Find out what the people are saying. Everybody will tell you the same thing. So make sure you give OTR Solutions a call at 470-900-3338 or click the link in the bio below. Make sure you check them out and tell them Truck and Hustle sent you. But how do you come up with that number, the difference between boulders or sand? Like, how, is, 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 a, is a boulder a dollar and sand is 50 cents? Like, how are you formulating that number? Based on repair cost. <laughs> okay. I've seen where it costs. So you before. actually look at the re repair that it yes. may potentially, there the damage go. potential to your truck. Correct. And you have to kind of weigh that into your price. I have to weigh that into the price because if, if you, if you, eventually, if you eat certain type of food every day, every day, it's going to have an adverse effect on your stomach yeah. if you look at it that way. Yeah. So eventually, every day, it's going to cost more wear and tear with certain materials. So you have to charge premium money or do an upcharge for the material. Got it. Why Why is some some jobs uh, waiting and the other ones are hourly? What's the difference between those jobs? Just distance? It's the contractor. It's just the preference. So okay. you would never want to run asphalt by the load. 
You can't do that. It has to be an hourly job because when you think about it, sometimes you got state inspectors there based on if it's a government contract, state inspectors, it's time consuming. Okay, so let me give you this example. From yeah. point A to point B is uh, five miles, right? You charge $100. That's premium money, just saying. But what if you go on that job and you have to wait to dump your material. Now your day get messed up. You can't go for another load because of the type of job. So certain type of job, you cannot do it by the load. You have to work by the hour. And certain jobs, you got to run by the load based on what you're doing. So it all depends on the type of job and the contractor. So people are smart out here. So you know which jobs should be hourly versus which jobs should be low jobs. Right, right. So if sometimes you run into a job that was that is being paid by the load, should have been paid by the hour. You can be man enough and talk to the contractor like, hey, this is what we should have, you know. So you have jobs that are hour, load that should be hourly. Like we, there's a job over by Andrews Air Force Base. You will never get that job run by the by the load because. When the president comes in, that's where he flies into, Andrews Air Force Base. Mm. So when he's traveling, when the president is landing, everything is a shutdown. Right. So those type of jobs, you know, you take into consideration the surrounding, what the truck have to do, and then they know how to do our how versus price. low. How, how are those, are, are those jobs like, is that... Are they tip? Are they misclassified a lot, or is it usually like on point? No, on point. It's usually good. That's never. Usually, that's never, never really a discrepancy there. No. Okay, got you. Now you said uh, the contractor. When you say contractor, you mean like a broker? Like who? Who are you getting most of your work from? Is it brokers or is it directly um, from the actual um, the, the the whatever you want to call it? It would be. I don't know what the proper name for them would be, but. Um, um, who who do you get your work from mostly? My brother, your brother, and I have my own job. So the, so in your, in in the case, it'll be your brother who's a broker. Yes, he's the one that goes out. Most so of the time so, okay, so so he from. he's getting these jobs from who? From the contractors. From the contractors. And what is available? Correct. So okay, how do how do you find contractors? <laughs> uh you find contractor. Well, that's a tricky question. Most of the times is how the contractor finds you. Okay. Because if you're doing a great job and your name is out there, then it speaks for itself. But what if you're just getting right started? If, you, if you're just getting started, then you may want to... If Well, no one just gets up and buy a dump truck without knowing somebody who owns a dump truck. Okay. Th that's, that's just that's just that's it. That's just like common sense. Common sense. You, yeah, of course. You're not going to buy a, a dump truck and not know... You may not know how to drive the truck as yet, but you're going to know... I'm getting into this. I should know this person. Somebody got to be a mentor. Somebody, there's some, somebody have to be involved. Nobody just gets up and buy a dumb truck at random and then walks around doing stuff. So somebody. I mean, yeah. some people do, but not many not successful many. people do. Right. <laughs> so, but I, I have heard some stories out there. People just buy them and jump in and figure it out as they go along. That's true, but very rare. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very rare. But yeah, I get most of my jobs from my brother, but I have grown where I know I'm um, connected with one or two other customers who gives me uh, like a, I work for a company called CPE mm -hmm. and um, they allow me to, you know, uh, broker trucks as well. Okay. Very good company to work for. Um, so sometimes it, it works. It works all the time. So if my brother had not allowed me to spread my wings and grow sometimes i give him work yeah not not very often but sometimes he may say hey you got a job because sometimes jobs cancel sometimes as the rain fall you have jobs so you always want to keep the wheel turning got it got so it. i have my own customers and i do get you know work from my brother as well what's the dump truck community like how how is it a cutthroat industry do guys work together how do you f feel <laughs> like working with your peers tell me about that um, truth be told, it's a cutthroat industry, sad to say. Um, but as long as you're solidified with, you know, the right cost, if the customer trust, you got to trust your customer and your tr customers have to trust you. Cutthroat industry, because I know of, <laughs> I've known of situations where this guy got a lot of trucks and, you know, he just under undercuts most of the times, you know. He approached a customer of mine and he's like, hey, um, I have 
the, twice the amount of lane trucks. <laughs> mm. Not only that, I I don't even need travel time because when you're doing hourly jobs, you always want to put, you know, it's customer where you add travel time to your charge. So if you work eight hours, at the end of the day, the truck gets nine hours. You call it travel time. Yeah. And the customer told, the guy told my customer like, hey, I'm not even tra- charging you travel time. Matter of fact, I'll give you two trucks for free for one week. Let me know how you feel about that. Mm, man, he's so making an offer he can't refuse. Yes. So it is a cutthroat industry. But if you have customers where you have already built a lasting relationship with, you have nothing to worry about. So it is, um, and it is, it is saturated as well, yeah. you know, and you have, you know, there isn't a, com- uh, one of the things I'd like to see is truckers coming on, on board together. I honestly believe there's no togetherness really in the dumb truck world here in Maryland, especially in Maryland, because sometimes these jobs are, are the contract, sometimes the, bro- not say the brokers, but sometimes the contractors are underpaying, honestly. Right. And then you, if you have guys who, if you have a community here that says, hey, you know what? We have a shutdown. We're not no truck ones because we want the price to go up. You're going to always find another set of guys who was just waiting for that opportunity to plug themselves in at a cheaper yeah, it's rate. always going to be one. Always going to. That's why that'll never happen. Be one. So it will never happen. Yeah. It's so always you, one that's willing to go against the grain and say, you know what? Everybody's going left, but we gonna we go, go right. right. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why I love my company name, Lane. You know, I just stay in my lane. Yeah. You know, I know that what I bring to the table, I'm not worried about nobody, to be honest. Yeah. I, I'm I'm not, you know, I've been doing this as as you can see, every year I continue to grow. This is not just by uh a mistake. Uh, every decision I make, like I say, I pray about it, it's intentional. And uh, so far, I still retain the same customer base that I have. And um, my brother is still doing well for himself. So yeah. I got that on my side as well. Where? So just so people understand, where's the company now? How many trucks do you have? And what are you guys kind of primarily focused on? We currently have eight powered units. Um, we Well, nine. We just bought another brand new dump truck. Um, we have a trailer we do you know we can do equipment hauling not like excavators but like skid steers and so forth we have a trailer we do have a skid steer company on skid steer bobcat um we have two super duty um pickup trucks where we you know do like parking lots in the winter time we do cleaning um we have a service a fully decked out service truck we do roadside assistance i i actually do that myself so I no longer drive the trucks. I make myself available for my drivers. We also just started up a startup truck wash. So we do offer that service to you know other truckers in the vicinity. We also offer you know preventative maintenance you know for others you know who you know that's you know we offer that services as well. Yeah. So what made you start getting to all these other different verticals? Well being be owning over <laughs> with the number of trucks you have to this is how you can you know, help what you do for yourself because so you figure it, out you can do it for other people as correct well. if you see my repair bill sometimes and these are repairs that i don't do myself if when it comes down to engine work i don't repair it myself i have a company contractor named supreme repairs yeah um they do all my repairs and um even as I try to contain the repair costs, it's 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 an astronomical. It's the average repair bill. Average repair bill. Well, right now, I think you had asked me that question earlier. We are what the company makes. We are at a two million over two million a year right now. Yeah. Yeah. This company generates two million dollar gross. So out of that, um, the last time I saw the repair bill was, oh, my goodness, over three hundred, almost three hundred thousand dollars. Wow. In repairs and. Um, this is contained. I'm talking about. So for the year, three hundred thousand dollars for the year. About three hundred thousand dollars. And what what are most of the repairs that that cover the bulk of that cost? Is that like in PMs? Is that in um, engines being blown? Like what's what's the, the, what takes the bulk of that? The bulk of that is engines just going bad. How often does that happen? Not very often, but you know these trucks go under immense pressure sometimes, and that's the reason why I was saying I prefer hourly jobs. You know, yeah, they turbo because an average rebuild repair for engine gonna run depending on the engine. On average, it's gonna take you like anywhere from thirteen to twenty thousand dollars easy, 
and then you have different PMIs, um, you know, stuff that happens like your rear end, if that gets messed up or you have a differential getting damaged, that's a couple thousand dollar repair right there. Mm. So if you think about it, I have uh, eight trucks and you think about each truck, then that's where you get that bulk of the money, you know, going to repairs. Yeah, yeah. Wow, ton of money in repairs. Correct. Okay, cool. How, how much How much does each truck typically gross? You mean weekly? Weekly, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anywhere from ballpark figure. Ballpark figure. You're looking at anywhere from twenty five hundred to maybe five grand okay. a week. Because know what they do. some days the rain may fall, and if the rain falls, you can't work. So somewhere between that line, if you have a good week, you could do very good. Um, especially if you do like night jobs, you know, like your driver is willing to come out at night to do some asphalt or milling, mm-hmm. then you are, you're, you're talking about, you know, up to 7,000. Got it. Just so saying. when, when that happens, when the rain falls, how do you compensate for that loss of, of revenue? Um, for me personally, I, I, uh, provide opportunities for my guys in the yard so all of my drivers, every single one of them, the minute they come on board, I teach them how to adjust their brakes, how to do stuff, PMI. So there are times when I want to change some tires. I provide a job for my guys. If rain falls and the jobs get canceled, I still allow them to come to the yard. Once the rain stops falling, wash some trucks, mm. <laughs> you know, do stuff. And I'll just pay them at a, 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 a lesser hourly rate, which yeah. they understand, but it still keeps money coming in. So I have a team who is committed and understands that if it rains, I keep money. And that's, you know, word out there for potential um, job seekers. You know, I provide work year round, you know, you will never have a really have a day that, you know, your job get canceled and I don't provide something for you to do. Do you plow in the wintertime? Certainly. Um, That's 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 what I love about the dump (laughs) (laughs) truck. We didn't get the snow that was planned for and um this year you know i i do plow i i invested a lot we invested a lot of money into acquiring you know all our trucks are equipped to do snow plowing we I, we acquired the two pickup trucks and that being said we have a gov- we have the state contract so all my trucks mm. i did such a good job every year do such a good job that the state took all my trucks and I have an assigned route. Mm. So every year, this is where no cutthroat can take place. Nobody can take my snow contract. Mm. And I say that proudly because my guys are properly trained and they don't need a babysitter. And that's what the state wants to know that they can, you know, get involved with a company that does not need that micromanagement. You know, your route, you know, when to put the salt, you know, when to plow that type of stuff. So, um, we do that every year. Every year, I have my contract awarded to me. Every year. How'd you How'd you get that? And how does it continue to be awarded to you? And how long do you have it for? Let's ask what? you a couple questions there. So how'd you get it? How'd you how get did the state I get contract? it? Uh my mentor again. Okay. My brother kicked me out because he used to broker. <laughs> <laughs> so he just told me one year, say, "Hey, you need to sign on with the state. You know, they're taking on trucks." He told you about it. It was very hard to get in. It took me over four, what, three years to get my first, over three years really. It took me three years or two years rather for me to get in with the state because it's so, they have a number that they work with. So if anyone, the only time they increase is based on the year before or if someone who was on the contract decides, hey, I'm not working snow again, then it opens the door for someone else. Which really probably happens, Which right? really happens because no one, the snow yeah. money is good money. Yeah. So I got in, my brother told me about it, and I got in with one truck, and at the time I was driving, and um, they saw how I performed. I was very communicative. I'm big on, big on communication. So they saw how I worked, my ethic, and I asked them, hey, you know, I have another truck, which was Angie at the time, and um, they say, sure, if, if you're doing good and you have another truck, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a replica of you. So right. I got in, and then I grew to four trucks, and every time I grow, I ask them, and they say, yes. We need people like you, reliable. So I have eight trucks contracted with the state right now, and um, it gets renewed every year. And uh, my customer, a customer of mine, one of my favorite customers, they have now diversified into um, doing parking lots and stuff like that. Mm. So 
I don't not only do asphalt and stuff for them. No, they give me that part of the contract where I uh, provide them with the pickup trucks to do the parking lots. And I thank God my brother allowed me to leave the nest because <laughs> I split that between both of us. Got you. So Got yeah, you. I, I have a six, six vehicle contract. Okay. So I take two out of it and I give the rest to him. Got it. Is the uh, the snow money hourly as well? That's hourly, certainly. Okay. Hourly Got hourly. you. Are you able to reveal what that what you get paid an hour for that? <laughs> uh, like ballpark. Of course. I mean, it's no secret what the state pays. Of course, I can tell you that. Yeah. You okay. Google the rate. Okay. It just depends. Anywhere from one hundred and ninety dollars to two hundred and twenty-five dollars an hour. Okay. It just depends on the area that you're in. And but, and am I right to say like when you when you get called on the snow contract, you get paid whether it snows or not, right? Certainly. Once they make that phone call. They will have what you call hold time and plow time, you know, but you get paid regardless. You, you know, that's where, that's what I strive for. I hope the snow falls this summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Look at California. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm very, I'm still hoping. You might want to move something. out to California, man. Trust me. There's some opportunities out there with the snow these days. And then um, even in New York, uh, my brother is liaison with, you know, the state of New York too, mm. where if the snow falls over certain inches, they call for trucks from him. Got it. There was a case where he mobilized like 50 trucks one year, send it up to New York from Maryland. Okay. So we're pretty vested in and, and looking forward to some snow. Okay. Where, where, for somebody who's looking to get into the dump truck industry, where, where would you say is the best place to start? Where's the best opportunities at? Uh, where are the opportunities at? The best place to start. Well, the best place to start, first of all, of course, you're going to get into it. You're going to know somebody, but is buying a truck. By, by buying a truck, you want to ensure that you, first thing you want to know, you, you have to know where you're getting the jobs from, to be honest, if you want to be on the safe side, especially these days. I would say buy, try to buy a truck cash, to be honest. Get your, and if you're buying a truck, a used truck, ensure you have at least $20,000. Take this from me. At least $20,000 put aside because anything can go wrong on the truck. You know what I'm saying? You mm. could just buy a truck and then something happens and it takes a couple of thousand. I've seen it. I've lived it. So the best place to start is having a mentor, somebody who is in the business, somebody who, you know, somebody who you know preferably, who's going to, you know, be there for you and make sure that you work. You know, somebody is going to be fair and yeah. then transparent with the rates. Got it. Yeah. What What do you say to someone who says who who says that you wouldn't be where you're at today without your brother? I would say to that person that I wouldn't be my brother wouldn't be where he's at today with somebody, and that somebody wouldn't be where they are to help my brother without God. Mm. That's what I would say because you have to understand that without God, man cannot, and without man, God will not. So you have to understand that. Though I got the word, God had to provide a vessel. So he's not just going to give you the word. That's why faith without works is dead. If my brother wasn't available, I would have still been where I'm at today because I got the word. So if my brother wasn't cooperating under the unction, <laughs> God would have found somebody else. You forgot that we serve a God who allowed the donkey to talk. <laughs> somebody else would have been there. So... I, without my brother, if he didn't want to, if he was a crooked, wicked brother, yeah. God would find the right person. So I'm written. here. It's not because of my brother. I'm here because of my brother was just the conduit, the conduit. that the Lord used. It was written. It was written. It was you know, written his already. word don't return to him void. We all know that. I love that. I love that. <laughs> All right, cool, man. Well, I think we, we kind of covered uh, most of it. Is there anything that I left out? Uh, that you wanted to talk about no um no um not uh, more, more i would like to see more government contracts to be honest you'd like to see more government contracts yeah available to 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 the to the truck trucking exclusively without it have to you know be going through contractors you know what i'm saying because mm. and i'll say this publicly man sometimes you you know you're going to have your favorite person, but it, where government contract is concerned because it's so lucrative, make it more accessible to the small guys. Mm. That's, that, that's how I feel about that. That's what I 
probably want to get out there. Are you certified minority owned business? Um, I'm not. Well, yes. Okay. I'm waiting on my approval. You waiting I, on approval? So you're going I already the submit the process and everything. I mean, that may that may open up some opportunities. Certainly, you know. What if my brother isn't here to answer his phone? Right, right. <laughs> you know, you start to think outside the box. Exactly, exactly. So, so. All right, cool, man. Well, um, I think we're gonna wrap it there. So typically on this show, we always um, do two things at the end. We always have a final thought which is basically something entrepreneurial, something spiritual, whatever you want to leave the audience with. And then lastly, you have to let everybody know where they can connect with you, where they can learn more about lane construction and more about yourself. So start with where they can find you, um, you know, website, uh, pay, whatever social media you have out there, wherever the best place to contact you is. Um, the best place to contact me, I'm on Facebook, Dwayne Wilshire, of course. We have a, a page, uh, in uh, Instagram page at Lane Construction. So that's Lane underscore construction underscore LLC. You could, you know, look at the jobs that we do there. Um, we are based out in Greenbelt, Maryland. And um, thought that I would leave is, uh, I don't, this is my company motto right here. I can do Philippians four thirteen, man. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, just if if you don't if you operate by faith, not by sight, and don't let anybody spoil your dream. You know, just be intentional about your decision, and you know, like like momentum means doing something after you just to you know have that killer instinct to know that you know you serve a God who. Who he got you, man? You know we're we're all uh, we're all born to be great. You know, so I I leave that just prayerfully do what you do. That's what got me here. To be honest, I have nobody to give credit to, but you know the man above. Yeah. yeah. What, what what's your goals? Where do you want to see this business grow to? Um, I want to start. I I think I've been you know looking into it. Do my own excavation starting to get bid my not just bid my own jobs but you know haul my own dirt mm. you know i want to see lane construction loading lane construction trucks and mm. sharing it with others so that's my vision you know to you know venture into excavation and hauling our own dirt and also you know acquiring a uh our own property you know a property that's properly zoned that we can um, not just park our own trucks, but we can store our material, our aggregates, and you know do distribution from there. That's the vision that I have. Is that why you named it Lane Construction as opposed to like Lane Trucking? It looks like Correct. Sally, you were thinking bigger. I I well, I was very intentional about the name Construction. Yeah. You know, we do landscaping. We 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 are multi you know multi talented here so I didn't just want to say trucking I want to do everything so there you go yeah. you're a smart guy man hey man I tried man I've been around the block a few <laughs> times <laughs> yeah well good all right man well this has been an amazing conversation thank you for your transparency and just sharing your journey with us um, hustle fam if you don't respect that your whole perspective is whack you know what we do around <laughs> this time you like that I like that. <laughs> So, you know, we always do around this time. If you smell something burning, it's only a desire. Myself, Dwayne Wilshire from Lane Construction. Uh, we out. Yeah, peace. Thanks for having me, man. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.